Welcome back. We are jumping into the second to the last chapter in the book, which is Global Theater Today. Global Theater Today. So we're on page 267. And we have to begin with a sort of disclaimer, which is to say that we really don't know what is going to last. Um, you know, we big transition here. We have you know, Vincent Van Gogh, he obviously was poverty ridden during his lifetime. You may know him as the um, painter of Starry Night, uh, you know, and his paintings now sell, uh, well, they're priceless, honestly. And um, in art and music, that's able to happen because their works live on after them. But in theater, it's much more difficult to pin down because it is ephemeral. It does, is a living, breathing thing and um, it doesn't always kind of live on the same way that um, a sculpture or a painting can. So we come to this with a certain amount of humility. What may look like some lasting uh, meaningful piece of art now, you know, uh, 20 years, you may look back and say, Miss Seal didn't know what she was talking about. That, that you know, piece of artwork proved to be very uninfluential. <laughs> so we uh, walk into this with a bit of humility. So for our purposes, let's kind of break down how the world has changed since the last art form that we talked about. So um, in modernity, which would be kind of up to the 1950s-ish, it's not, you know, a perfect system, but they believed in truth with a capital T, something that was um, definitely uh, what's right for me is right for everybody else. Whereas a uh, postmodern uh, in mind frame, uh, which I'm not saying that you necessarily are a postmodern person just because you lived in, live in a postmodern age, um, but postmodern individuals tend to see truth as, some, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to move those Google photo back up. <laughs> uh, I apologize for that distraction. Um, where was I? Uh, so most individuals um, in a postmodern age believe more in what's right for me may not be what's right for you. Uh, tolerance is a, an, another way of saying that. Um, modernity believed that we could um, kind of look at the universe and see ordered and logical consequences for action. You know, if somebody um, gets cancer, we're going to use the scientific method to deduce uh, why they got cancer, what foods were they eating, uh, what environments are they exposed to, and that to a certain extent can be true. Uh, but postmodernity, in its art forms at least, tends towards um, seeing life as arbitrary and random. Uh, you know, if you get cancer, c'est la vie, that's life. And most postmodern um, philosophers tend to embrace that chaos. Modernity believed that reality is concrete, um, something that you can understand, uh, as opposed to um, postmodernity. Reality is really just a social construct. So when we look at something like gender, we'll talk about gender today. Um, a postmodern uh, person working from postmodern framework, uh, from that worldview, from that perspective, uh, might say that gender is a spectrum, and so. It if you are necessarily born as a boy and you feel like you identify more closely with a woman, well, gender is just reality. It's just a social construct. So if you want to um, become transgender, then, or, you know, become a transvestite, then, you know, that's, you can alter your own reality as opposed to conforming to a, um, to a, knowable reality that is the world. Uh, big talk <laughs> for a theater class, but um, that just kind of hopefully gives you sort of a framework as he kind of goes on at the beginning and it, he says it very artfully, but it can be a little less um, a little less concrete. Uh, so I'm just trying to kind of boil it down to the boilerplate version. For those of you who are students of philosophy, you know uh, this is in some ways a bastardization, but for the purposes of our class, uh, this may help you to understand some of these um, 
trends we'll see today and the uh, ways that, that the philosophy is informing it. So to try to make this even more concrete, we we'll look at the Vietnam Memorial. So if you walked up to a memorial in uh, former times, it was usually a sculpture of a person, maybe they're in battle, maybe it's a sculpture of an important person, and then it often had kind of a motto, um, gone but not forgotten, in quotation marks at the bottom of the sculpture, and that would tell us what to think. It's giving us that universal truth, it's telling us what the meaning of the um, sculpture is, and we can kind of walk away and say, huh, I see what that artist was trying to tell us. Now, if you've ever been to the Vietnam Memorial in DC, um, it's a very, uh, for me at least, it was an emotional experience because along this wall there are um, the names of those who died and it's very uh, off-putting. You don't know how to feel about it. Obviously, seeing the individual names is a nod to what you know, we would think of as individualism, right? Um, but another thing that makes this a postmodern piece of art is if you come at it from a different angle, you don't even see it because it's down kind of below. So it's all a matter of perspective, an individual perspective. There is nobody telling you what to think. There's no laugh track, as it were. Uh, forgive the uh, crass uh, sort of simplification of it, but... Um, Postmodernity is more willing to embrace the mystery of life and the individual interpretations as opposed to um, setting to a clear motto. There's a fair critique that he brings up in your book. Um, there's a call to open theater that really uh, this um, theater a philosopher brought out and it really did change the shape of many and, and I think just the changing times. What happens um, as a woman when you are being represented or as a minority, right? That's Laurence Olivier in blackface um, and he would have been playing this black man <laughs> as written by a white man and portrayed by a white man and in what ways is that unfair? In what ways does he not fully understand what it was like to be the only black military officer surrounded by white men? I, I don't think Laurence Olivier can actually understand that on any real level. Um, Laurence Olivier, by the way, is a very famous BBC, um, uh, not BBC, uh, a British actor. He, uh, the Olivier's is the name of their Oscars. It just tells you how important he is. Um, you may recognize the actress on the right there. That's Maggie Smith. She is uh, Dame Maggie Smith. She is a professionally, uh, classically trained actress, but you probably know her as Professor McGonagall from um, the Harry Potter series or, uh, um, oh, it's the Victorian. I anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, if we look at a play like Taming of the Shrew, which is also by Shakespeare, uh, you know, what happens in Taming of the Shrew is he gets this stubborn woman and he basically beats her into submission and not in a Fifty Shades of Grey kind of way. I mean, he really does. It was modeled after the Punch and Judy in the Italian Commedia dell'arte, which was, you know, literally the joke was that Punch would punch Judy. That That's the funny that's the, f the funny part, uh, you know, making light of domestic violence. And so, um, you know, we, we admire Shakespeare for his poetry, but he also is sort of stuck in some, um, some unfair gender roles. Uh, and this happens definitely in Hollywood. Um, you know, another kind of problem is uh, the lack of leading roles for people of color in Hollywood. If we look at the 2000 film Pay It Forward, uh, that was actually based on a novel, and in the novel the leading character was African American, and he suffered from keloids, which is um, a scar tissue issue that only happens in African Americans, and Hollywood actually rewrote the story to, with Kevin Spacey as the leading uh, man and he had scars instead of keloids but you rarely see a part that is originally uh, for a white man rewritten so that it can be played for a person of color 
right? So uh, in what ways is Hollywood still not willing to take risks on women and um, African American or, or any people of color? So today we'll be um, discussing a lot, um, just kind of the rise of minorities and how they've come to represent themselves, uh, which is a nice um, change <laughs> from everything we've looked at before, a sort of an ethnic identity movement, as uh, Wong put it in his interview. So um, another example of this, uh, if, if you don't know about this uh, Chinese tradition of lotus feet, which is uh, wrapping uh, your a woman's feet uh, so that they'll be smaller, which is considered more attractive. And in the Chinese opera, remember, uh, men depicted women, and they uh, took these tiny little steps in order to portray women um, because a lot of women had to take small steps because of this torturous uh, and barbaric tradition of binding feet and um, and so if you can imagine being a modern woman you know when when Chinese opera came in back into time you're walking and taking these tiny little steps in order to portray um, this barbaric tradition but not only that it, but a man is teaching you how to walk like a woman right <laughs> So um, uh, th this, you know, as a woman, you can kind of understand how this is demeaning, right? Um, the end of Taming of the Shrew, the, the happy ending is that she bows down and kisses the feet of um, the man who's beaten her into submission. I don't think many um, self-respecting women would do that. So uh, what this led to is a call to action for women. We need to write our own stories, a call to action for people in minority. We don't need to have blackface plays anymore. We need to have um, people of color writing plays about their own traditions. Um, and that is much more um, self, you know, we're writing history down. And so um, this is Alan Cummings. He's a... Uh, a homosexual and he uh, represents often um, the homosexual agenda in politics and in plays. Uh, he tends to, uh, you know, um, speak out very vocal. Uh, in this picture he's doing Macbeth but he's playing every part in Macbeth. So he's both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth and he's doing it all from in the confines of a mental hospital. So um, just talking about once again, that postmodern philosophy that gender is up for interpretation, which we also kind of saw in Julie Tamor's interpretation of Prospera rather than Prospero, right? Remember, she cast Helen Mirren as the lead in that Shakespeare play. So, um, you know, Shakespeare is in some ways universal and in some ways it's not. So uh, women's theater. So obviously, uh, if we look at something like um the vagina monologues. That's one that's often done in Women's History Month. Uh, but there's a lot um, more uh, women doing theater for other women to celebrate womanhood. One of my favorites is Wendy Wasserstein there. Um, you can see Meryl Streep. She was one of the earliest uh, female writers to get serious recognition such as a Pulitzer Prize. So... Another kind of example of this gender bending uh, comes with a uh, author who is called Jane Martin, but it's commonly known that Jane Martin is just a pen name for John Drury, uh, who works out of Louisville, the Actress Theatre of Louisville, and so he's writing these plays to support women's rights, and uh, somewhat controversially, I mean, you know, hopefully women can get published on their own, right? Um, but I appreciate him because he gave me one of the best uh, plays of my career, which was Flaming Gums of the Purple Sage. You can see there's three leading, leading ladies there, uh, really strong women who are playing strong female roles. So um, I'm not going to hate him for it. Uh, I appreciate anybody he uh, who is putting strong female leads out there. Um, he also wrote... Uh, a really popular form of Pride and Prejudice, a, a kind of new uh, interpretation or version of it. So that's another um, example of how he writes for women through this pen name of um, Jane Martin. 
All right, so I had you listen to a clip uh, from Raisin in the Sun and then some of the actors sort of um, commenting on how that clip, uh, you know, what that clip means within the context of the African-American community. Um, this is by far one of the most important plays of our time. And, uh, you know, Raisin in the Sun, it's just that image of a grape uh, going from a grape and drying slowly into a raisin. Uh, you know, in what ways was Walter Lee, this uh, character played by P. Diddy there, down there, uh, you know, he was just a chauffeur and he was denied opportunity after opportunity. And when Lena, uh, played by Felicia Rashad in the blue there, in the light blue, uh, you know, when she won't even loan him money, she gets this big check, but she she doesn't feel like he's a sound investment. And that just continues to dry up his dreams and dry up his dreams and then she does invest in him and spoiler alert uh, he wastes it away he makes a bad investment so um, it's a really powerful story it's a it's poetic realism so it is very much a kind of snapshot of history what it was like to be in uh, the south side of Chicago uh, in the late 50s which I think is important plays like this um, plays uh, that were written by African Americans for African Americans were before this were often done in churches especially here in the south they called it the Chitlin circuit their words not mine <laughs> um, but they would perform you know African American uh, performers would go around to different churches and sort of um, perform these plays for each other but Lorraine Hansberry and Raisin in the Sun actually went all the way to Broadway and that was really exciting um, we have some important off-Broadway uh, plays that he mentions as well, such as Amari Baraka's The Dutchman, uh, which would have been uh, of the Malcolm X mindset. He was trying to startle people. Amari Baraka was trying to um, warn people about um, the power of the black man. Uh, but uh, Lorraine Hainsbury is more about just capturing the truth of the moment, and unfortunately she died very, very young. I often think what would have happened um, if if she hadn't died. Uh, so uh, the Chitlin Circuit still kind of exists today. Uh, Tyler Perry's plays are still performed in churches and in um, theaters. Uh, I think the Von Braun has Tyler Perry plays, not necessarily that you're going to get to see the man Tyler Perry, uh, but um, uh, that would still be in the vein of what they called the Chitlin Circuit. So, and, and Tyler Perry, you know, has made quite a bit of money off those performances as well as his movies. Very successful. There's just one of those cool posters. I love the 1960s. They just have such a cool aesthetic. Uh, so um, just as the Chitlin Circuit, uh, a lot of theater was performed in plays. Uh, the Louis Valdez, the, you watched a clip of him talking about his um, theater that was political, that was, uh, re what did he call it, real theater of reality. Um, that political theater um, is also done in the Latino community. Um, on the right there, that's a play that I saw in Nashville called Alien. And it, the first half of the play was um, Irish in, immigrants in America and their story. And then the second half of the play um, was uh, a Hispanic family um, suffering similar trials. And when it came to kind of a climax was when um, someone was having a baby in a hospital and wasn't uh, given an interpreter and you know they had very little idea what was going on which is a very nightmarish kind of scene if you can imagine as a woman having a baby without understanding what was going on they also induced her labor without her permission um, and we have heard stories uh, horror stories like this that have actually have happened in Tennessee a woman uh, so they're based you know partially in fact a woman was arrested uh, for not having any identification on her she was handcuffed to a bed and had her baby without being able to breastfeed her baby um, and so once again this activism kind of theater and representing and once again that the name of that musical is Alien the musical by Greg Garner if you want to look it up um, but I like what Valdez said about you know the um, the Latino man constantly being stuck in this 19th century sombrero sort of um, 
uh, stereotype rather than being taken seriously. And uh, although I've never, oh, I don't speak Spanish, so <laughs> that is the limitation. I've never seen any of these works that were done on the border. I do think that it's a very interesting and grassroots approach to um, seeing real change in America. So uh, that's John Leguizamo on the left. Uh, we'll come back to talking about his one-man show. Uh, he represents uh, in the Bronx, he went to NYU. He represents his um, mother and his sister and his girlfriends uh, and the way that he saw them in a very funny uh, one-man shows. He's got a series of them, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so you had to watch that big, long, long uh, interview, so I won't belabor the point much, but there's a picture of M. Butterfly uh, and uh, as it was represented um, I think that he's got some great things to say about the authenticity of speaking from your own voice and then dealing with your own identity with through that. Um, as we said, with Eugene O'Neill not wanting his plays published until after his death, there's a certain amount of responsibility that you have as a playwright um, that this makes it kind of scary to publish and uh, broadcast your ideas to the world. What I would like to do now is flip all the way back into chapter four. And because it kind of has a more in-depth look at some of these characters we skipped over when we were analyzing Alice in Wonderland. Um, so Wong, for example, uh, it gives here kind of a more in-depth look at what he's really good at, including being a librettist who writes the book part of the musical, such as Aida or Tar Tarzan, so he's got obvious ties to Disney. So he's enjoying a lot of commercial success. It's not just that he has um, a niche market off-Broadway. Uh, you know, these uh, Flower Drum Song was running on Broadway, so um, he's having a lot of commercial success as well. So gay theater is definitely a subset of the theater um, today. Uh, there have always been homosexuals in the theater. Uh, we look at Oscar Wilde in the turn of the century who was actually put on trial. He uh, endured a court case uh, for sodomy and then Tennessee Williams was openly gay, uh, a southern writer who did uh, Streetcar Named Desire, A Glass Menagerie, uh, but today th they spoke in um, you know, uh, innuendo. There's a line insinuating, for example, in A Streetcar Named Desire that part of the reason that Blanche Dubois has gone crazy is that her, she caught her husband sleeping with another man. Uh, but it was very subtle. It was not um, an overt statement. The way that obviously Rent in this picture is um, we have a lesbian couple, we have a transvestite, uh, we have gay men, so um, it's very much a celebration of uh, the gay lifestyle. Uh, and um, to look a little deeper into gay theater, uh, let's take a look at Angels in America. So uh, if you'll turn over, oh, turn back a page, that's why I was getting so confused. Turn back to page uh, 79. We can take an in-depth look at the author Tony Kushner. Uh, the if the most likely you've um, been exposed to Tony Kushner is uh, through his not 2012 movie Lincoln, starring starring Daniel Day Lewis. You may be familiar with uh, Tony Kushner. Um, I first became aware of Tony Kushner when uh, he appeared in a documentary uh, war of theater a theater of war sorry and uh, that was a Brecht documentary my interest in Brecht kind of took me there um, Angels in America came out in 1993 uh, so still very much before the AIDS crisis had fully um, come as far in medical advances it has today. Uh, you can watch it if you, as I'm recording this anyway, if you have HBO Go or um, HBO On Demand, uh, there's a six-part miniseries that is um, directed by Mike Nichols. It has uh, Meryl Streep in it, a lot of big names, Mary Louise Parker, uh, if you've ever seen Weeds. Uh, uh, it's definitely rated R, a lot of language, some full frontal nudity. I, as far as I know, I don't think it's ever been, well, I won't say that. It's not, it's not produced often in the South, I'll say that. Um, it's 
set in the 1980s. It's a lot about kind of the culture wars that were going on with Reagan and AIDS, um, but it's told very intimately through two sets of couples, um, one who's homosexual and one who is um, Mormon, and the Mormon male is, is closeted. He's really uh, dealing with his own issues. And the Mormon uh, wife is addicted to Valium. And this is a theme that we see a lot in the modern age is, is pills, uh, pharmaceuticals, and the abuse of pharmaceuticals. Uh, because it does go back to that expressionistic, um, n you know, nightmarish, it gives opportunities every time that Mary Louise Parker's character in the miniseries, every time that the Mormon wife sort of takes these Valium, then she has these, uh, um, she has these visions that are, you know, dreamlike and we get acted out uh, these different scenarios and then you know we have uh, the uh, m main character Lewis his partner Pryor Pryor gets AIDS and as he is suffering uh, with AIDS he starts taking heavy medication that also gives him these delusions which is when the angel obviously you see him uh, and the angel shows up so this uh, psychopharmacologist kind of theme once again is is a throwback to the fascination with psychology in in the realism movement so we pushed it to extreme we've taken it to an extreme there's another musical um out right now uh it, that has a song is actually my psychopharmacologist and i it's a very funny kind of take and really tony kushner is very funny uh i uh I think that he's hilarious, and even though he's talking about something as serious as AIDS and a healthcare crisis, uh, he does it with such wit and such intelligent wit, um, and uh, kind of part of the um, political, uh, medical political issue going on is this character named Roy Cohn, and he is... Um, a closeted gay man, closeted uh, Jew, who was very inclu included in the McCarthy era, uh, McCarthyism, and had Ethel Rosenthal put to death. Uh, Rosenberg, sorry, not Rosenthal. Uh, Ethel Rosenberg put to death. And so um, he makes a call, he has AIDS as well, and he makes a call and gets an entire shipment full of the experimental drugs that um, were was so valuable at the time of the AIDS crisis that, you know, not everybody got to be part of this experimental trial. In fact, a lot of homosexuals had to do a blind, um, participate in a blind study so that it could get through the FDA. And as a result, of course, many were given placebo and died. Uh, and so it's sort of bringing up these medical issues and medical rights and um, kind of harkens back to maybe uh, the Tuskegee trial. If you know anything about um, the history of kind of experimentation in America, you know, a lot of us know that that happened in Germany, you know, during the Nazi times, we've seen these horrible pictures of separated twins being experimented on or people's guts being taken out. Um, but people don't always understand that there were not so clear lines in America in, in our history of times when people were um, part of studies and they didn't know it or, um, you know, they were injected with syphilis. <laughs> it, you know, um, we really uh, kind of brings to issue how are these people being treated based on how much money they have. And basically Roy Cohn um, is treated well because he has secrets and because he has money. Uh, and so it's a very unjust situation. And the play talks a lot about justice. What is justice? How do we overcome injustice in the world? Uh, it's a very long play. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, um, it does have a, a definite sense of depth. Mary, Lee, Mary Louise Parker's character, the uh, Mormon wife, uh, she speaks in stops and starts and she speaks in what a lot of people would consider like crazy talk. Uh, and she says, but she has moments of clarity. And my favorite one is at the very end when she says, in this world, there's a kind of painful progress, longing for what we've left behind and dreaming ahead. And uh, a lot of it is about progress at the end of the play spoiler alert uh, Pryor is still alive even though he was told that he had six months to live he has managed to live partially because of these stolen uh, medicines no doubt and and you know he's um, despite all uh, 
evidence to the contrary, he is still alive and he's still holding on. So it's a very hopeful uh, vision. But it's a very quirky sense of humor. You know, an Eskimo shows up. Um, you know, uh, there uh, there's just some very funny, funny moments. So, like I said, which are partially because of these drug-induced states and the hilarity that ensues with those. Uh, you know, prior in in this scene earlier, his his ancestors have showed up, <laughs> and uh, in their wigs and in their fancy dresses, uh, fancy clothes, and so it, it's a really funny play. And Tony Kushner is a big name in theater. I, I'm excited to see what else he will produce in my lifetime. So dangerous theater. Um, dangerous theater is marked primarily by torture. <laughs> Uh, there's kind of a growing trend of there being torture on stage in a play. Um, it is suspenseful. It is intense, of course. If you watch, uh, this is obviously not real torture, but if you watch uh, torture through a movie, that's one thing. Um, but being there, and it really helps your imagination go further. Uh, this uh, scene here. Oh, it's actually on page 286. Um, the Pillow Man by Martin McDonough is the play being depicted here. Um, in The Pillow Man, an author has a brother. Um, the author, he writes these horrible stories of uh, torture of young children, um, things like a razor blade in apple or a, a little girl being crucified. That happens on stage uh, because what happens is his brother actually goes out and starts to perform these horrible atrocities that his um, that the author writes about and so the question is kind of what to what extent is the creative mind um, prophetic you know we look at some sci-fi movies or short stories and then we see those those inventions actually come into being I mean how much is that sci-fi prediction um, has it planted the seed that then got the uh, engineer or the um, inventor going you know and so at we as artists if we create these stories in some ways uh, we're creating maybe a real scenario or we're we're encouraging something so and what responsibility does that bring to an author once again Martin McDonough has a great sense of humor a great turn of phrase it's not all torture and screaming um, and it happens in this police state as sort of um, super oppressive um, violent uh, regime which is kind of a common theme of these dangerous theater um, another play Harkening back to page uh, 81, that happens in that same uh, dangerous theater style is ruined by Lynn Nottage. Uh, Lynn Nottage won a Pulitzer Prize for this play, uh, partially because it's uh, so important and partially just because she's a very poetic and amazing writer. Uh, she modeled it after Mother Courage, which we talked about in modern theater. Remember Mo Mother Courage, who all of her children uh, died in war. And it has that same like main character who's ultimately not really that likable. And her name is also Mama. Uh, Mama runs a brothel in the Congo. And uh, she assures everyone that her the people in her brothel, the women in her brothel, are actually being taken care of more than they would be in their village, which is sort of a testament. In order to do research, Lynn Nottage uh, actually went to the Congo and interviewed people, and she used real people's experiences to tell the play, which I think makes it even more heartbreaking. Uh, you know, Mama is the main character, but the sort of secondary uh, character was raped with a bayonet. Um, it's just very graphic and uh, you know she comes in at one point and says you will not fight your wars on my body anymore and I just think that is a heartbreakingly honest and true uh, female perspective of what happens in war uh, you know rape has traditionally been a tactic in warfare uh, in order to uh, destroy civilizations uh, you know, the babies that come out of it are are shunned and the women are suffer from PTSD. And if we look at what's going on in the Congo or other parts of Africa in these wars, uh, the poorest of the poor and the women, the children, uh, they suffer. They really, truly suffer. And so 
the mutilization, the, the title of the play, Ruined, actually refers to um, this girl who was raped with a bayonet, and her husband, you know, den denies her. Her family uh, outcasts her after she's been raped, uh, you know, for some reason within that culture, she's the one who um, is outcast. So it's very, very sad. Um, like I said, uh, Mama in this play is not very likable as in, as Mother Courage. Uh, one of her lines is, if things are good, everybody eats. If things are bad, Mama eats first. So she's out for number one. She's out for herself. And um, she makes that very clear at all times. So, um, it's a short read if you want to check it out of the library uh, at MTSU or, or your public library. Like I said, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner, so it's, it's in a lot of libraries. And it's a pretty quick read if you're into women's rights uh, or Africa uh, as, an, as a point of interest or just from a human perspective. Uh, it's largely biographical. It's based on real people. So... Uh, there's Whoopi Goldberg in her early days. Uh, I put hers up because I really enjoy uh, Whoopi's one-woman show. Uh, she she has very funny moments, of course, because she's Whoopi Goldberg. But then she has very serious moments. Uh, she talks about, for example, coat hanger abortion. So um, solo performance is probably the biggest accomplishment for a actor I think uh, it, uh, personally as a performer it scares the bejesus out of me to think about being on stage for two hours by myself um, like we said John Leguizamo uh, as we're looking at uh, page uh, 291 oh I'm sorry I have the wrong page number there uh, let's turn over to 294 uh, or 293 so John Leguizamo had a one man had a couple one man shows, uh, also recorded by HBO. If you want to watch them, um, Spicarama, Freaking Sexaholic, Ghetto Clown, a very funny plays multiple characters. As you probably know, John Leguizamo uh, from film he did uh, the sloth character in the Ice Age movies. He was in Romeo and Juliet. He was Tybalt in the Leonardo DiCaprio version. Um, he was in Moulin Rouge. He's, he's had great success, um, but he still prioritizes these one-man shows. Uh, he's also very ADHD, and so his plays have that same Robin Williams frenetic energy. Um, Billy Crystal just won a Tony for his one-man show, which is also available on HBO if you want to watch it, uh, where he tells stories from his childhood, which I think is very personal and, and a pretty big theme. A lot of people, these are autobiographical, I imagine partially because uh, they're easier to memorize and more honest to see. Um, Lily Tomlin uh, had a one-woman show to great success, Signs for Intelligent Life in the Universe. Um, there's a one-man show of Christmas Carol, which I've seen excerpts from. It's very funny. Uh, but, like I said, this is a special skill. This is not something that I necessarily um, am going to sign up for anytime soon. Very impressive. Uh, nice work if you can get it, I say. Uh, but Will Eno, he's another big one-man show uh, comedy uh, performer. So... If you ever go, if you're looking, trying to pick your play that you would want to see, these one-man shows often run off-Broadway, and um, to great success, I think. Uh, comedians sometimes endeavor with them. If you haven't seen that trend already, I'll bring it up. Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, John Leguizamo, these are all comedians, although there are serious ones, but they tend more towards the stand-up type, kind of a meld between an autobiographical where portraying characters and also a little bit like stand-up. So, uh, just to say a word about local theater, um, as we talked about with the Chitlin Circuit, there is um, opportunities for grassroots movements, and often in the South, they happen in churches. Uh, you know, uh, the Alien uh, play that I saw that was produced by a church who was advocating for justice and welfare of. Um, Latino Americans um, 
you know, and we have this trend, this exciting trend in America right now, uh, which experts call the decentralization of communication. So it used to be if you wanted to do a big show, you went to New York. It used to be that if you wanted to record a movie, you went to Hollywood. Well, now as things are getting more technologically advanced, you can do a lot of things from anywhere. You can record a podcast in your home. Uh, or a video cast as I am doing um, and you can get your word out there without having all this expensive equipment um, and uh, things are starting to get more open to community theaters to repertory theaters for example Atlanta there's some really exciting things going on uh, at the Alliance in Atlanta uh, for example the musical bring it on based on the movie it first opened in the Alliance before it moved to Broadway so um, just evidence of the decentralization of communication um, it's still common in the South for theater to happen in churches. It's just kind of the readily advantage. And I'm not just talking about Christmas cantatas or Easter pageants. Um, so, you know, Spring House Theater in Smyrna, they're doing um, plays as sort of an outreach program. I went and saw Pride and Prejudice there. Uh, there are also um, religious theaters. Like if you go uh, down to Houston, they have the AD players where they do explicitly uh, Christian plays from that perspective. Uh, Dad's Garage, though, here, the kind of goofy humor you can see is improv theater, which I think is uh, very fun, um, very entertaining if you're ever down in Atlanta to catch a glimpse of that. So... Um, there are lots in the book. He kind of mostly mentions uh, Baltimore and upstate New York, but don't let him fool you. There's some great things going on in the South as well. He may not be as aware of it because he's not from the South. He's from California, but there are some great things going on. Um, all right, so uh, that's just a glance at modern theater. You can see that I left a lot of big chunks out, puppet theater, uh, dance theater, um, but in the interest of keeping it short, uh, since I gave you the documentaries and it's the end of the semester, um, anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this lecture, and as always, thank you for listening.